I'm bringing the teaching from a couple of weeks ago as we continue in our study of the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead, okay? It's the fourth in a series of doctrines that Galatia, <laughs> what am I thinking of here? Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 and 2 um, lay out for us as the foundation, the elementary principles of the doctrine of Christ. So it's essential to us. It's essential to everything that the Bible reveals about Christ and what we need to learn, in other words, to be and to grow in Christ. So let's get back to it. We are now on the fourth one, the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead. So, you know, once again, as always, you want to get into our Bibles. And so um, open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. That's where we're going to be, okay? It's, um, it's a chapter that really is widely regarded by many as the great resurrection chapter. So get your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and uh, we'll get going, okay? The resurrection of the dead. You know, since the beginning of time, the reality of death has been shrouded in a dark pall of mystery. I mean, seriously, when you consider... Literally every day, hundreds of thousands of people die, as people really have since the beginning. I mean, <laughs> the statistics are pretty compelling. 100 out of every 100 people who are born eventually die. And it leads, I think, to the fact, who among us? Who among us, really? I mean, seriously, confronted with the passing of a loved one, not to mention being confronted with our own mortality as we get older and older, I know that at my age, yes, I, I, I get it. I didn't understand it or appreciate it, grasp it, or even be too concerned about it. I remember when I was much younger, but uh, it's just one of those things that as you grow older and uh, your loved one's passing away and then you realize people around you, your own generation are passing away, um, you know, you're confronted with your own mortality. And so, um, you know, really, I think who among us, having been faced with, confronted with the specter of death, physical death, hasn't found ourselves at one point or another uncertain, even troubled about what happens to people following the moment when these physical bodies cease to function and die? What happens to the soul, the spirit? What will it be like? when that happens to a believer in particular. That's, we want to talk about that today. Those of those who are in Christ, is, you know, this is like the fourth principle, elementary principle of the doctrine of Christ. Well, like we talked about last week, or should I say the week prior to this particular teaching, this question alone, what happens to a believer the moment their body ceases to function and dies. And that question alone has given rise to, well, you know, out there in the world, all kinds of theories, as well as religious and cultural beliefs about, well, what happens to the person? What happens to the soul and the spirit? Theories, you know, and beliefs that typically still, I find leaves people mystified, apprehensive, and even fearful about death, the specter and apparent, really, finality of physical death, and the mystifying and rather deeply troubling effect that it typically has on people as it invariably really confronts, I think, the serious limitations of mere human experience, knowledge, and understanding. Because, really, nobody comes back from the dead to tell us about it. I know there are stories about people having near-death experiences and seeing things, but um, when you understand what God's Word reveals about all of this, uh, you begin to re realize, well, no, you know, that doesn't actually happen. But fortunately for you and I, really the whole body of divine revelation that hopefully most of you have in your possession this morning, I pray, God's Word, the Bible, it sheds an abundance of clear and really conclusive light on what happens beyond the point of physical death. 
all of which gloriously comes together for us, I think here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Like I said, it's regarded by many as the great resurrection chapter of the Bible. So you guys ready to get into it this morning? Well, we're going to begin by launching off from this passage we were into last Sunday. Okay. Now, before we do, I just want to say one more thing about coming back from the dead and their death experiences. We base our understanding of the truth on what is revealed to us by God through his word. Nothing else. This for us as believers and those who are in Jesus Christ, who are born again of the Spirit, children of God thereby, this is our standard of truth, and this is the exclusive revelation of God to mankind regarding not only his person, but his purpose for our lives in Christ. And that includes from physical death on through to the resurrection of the dead and eternity. It's all in here, okay? So this is what we want to focus on. Not a lot of the things that you hear people say that this happened to them or that happened to this person. We stick to the Bible here, okay? And again, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 12 through 19. We read, Now if Christ is preached, proclaimed, that he has been raised from the dead, as Paul the Apostle, and as the word of God clearly and repeatedly declares, the question arises here, it says, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? Now, I think that this is meant to confront more than anything for you and I, the doubts that we have. Faced with physical death, I think especially if you are someone who is standing at, by the bedside of a loved one at the moment that the body ceased to function and it died, and you watch the monitor, the heart monitor, suddenly go flat, and all signs of life cease to exist. The life of the one that you once knew, and it's no more. <clears throat> it is a, it's like a door of finality just suddenly slams shut, and you realize, well, the person, what happened? And this is where the questions arise. And I think there were questions among the believers there in Corinth, as there have been among all of us from, well, from the very beginning. And so the questions arise, the doubts arise because of the seeming finality of physical death. And so here's the question, well then how do some among you say there's no resurrection of the dead? Because we can't see it, it hasn't happened yet. All we know is our loved one is not here anymore and all that's left is a body that will be interred and disintegrate, decompose, return to the earth either by one means or another. So, that's the question. And I think it really hits home. Okay? So let's first of all think about our faith. Let's think about our faith, our salvation in Jesus Christ as a matter of fact. Okay? Paul says there's a logical um, outworking here that we need to run through if you're really serious about this. Okay? And your faith in Jesus Christ and your salvation. So in verse 13, he continues, he says, now, okay, think this through. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And he says, if Christ is not risen, then he's telling us that the preaching of the apostles is empty. The word of God is void. Might as well throw it away. It's... And he says, therefore, your faith also is empty. There's nothing to it. No substance to it. Remember, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Well, it's worthless then if Christ is not risen from the dead. And if there is no resurrection of the dead, then, whoa, wait a minute here. What happened to Jesus? <laughs> and he goes on, he says, and yes, we are found false witnesses of God. Because, as Paul said, we have testified of God that he raised up Christ. And Paul, along with others, were eyewitnesses. But, well, if Christ is not risen from the dead, then, hey, that makes us all liars, right? 
the apostles and the others. And this is all a case. And indeed, if, in fact, he says the dead do not rise. Boy, doesn't that make you stop to think a little bit about this? As you contemplate the reality of physical death and what lies beyond. As a Christian now, you realize how incredibly critical this is to our faith. Because as he continues, he, he repeats this. He says, for if the dead do not rise, then, then Christ is not risen. And now let's talk about you. Let's, let's get down to you now. What does this all mean? He goes on, he says in verse 17, that if Christ is not risen, then your faith is futile, and you, you're still in your sins. And then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ, or in other words, those who have, who have also experienced physical death, have died, their bodies have died, okay, he refers to them as having fallen asleep, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit, but he's telling us, you know, then those who already ahead of you have fallen asleep in Christ, well, they've perished. That's right, they're lost forever, gone. So he says, if in this life we only have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. So like I said, seriously, this is how critical the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead is when it comes to the faith that we embrace and profess as genuine believers and followers of Jesus Christ. As those who are born of the spirit children of God in Christ Jesus, you deny, okay, number one, deny, distort, twist it, mess with it, make it fit whatever you think it should be, that's to distort it, or neglect just, you know, kind of blow it off like it doesn't, it's not important. The doctrine of the resurrection of the dead, well then, everything God's word has promised and everything we believe, talking about our salvation, our hope, and our destiny in Christ, suddenly becomes little more than a cruel hoax. At best, an outright lie and deception at worst, you know, however you want to characterize it. I mean, really, now all hope goes down the toilet, and the faith we profess gets relegated to the toy box of mere theological fantasy. The inevitable result being that if only we have faith in Christ, who alone is the very cornerstone and the foundation upon which our faith, salvation, an eternal destiny is based, then we of all people should be looked upon by everyone around us as pitiful on account of well, how, how stupid we are, how gullible we are in our miserable condition. I mean, yeah, look at those fools. <laughs> what a gullible bunch of idiots. More. These guys are, are dumber than anything the world has ever known. I mean, seriously, I mean, how does this sound to you? I'm thinking about the sign we have for uh, Living Springs Fellowship out there on the front of, of this um, building where we gather. You know, we could um, have the sign repainted to say Living Springs Fellowship of Idiots and Buffoons. <laughs> wow. I mean, worse than that, if you can even begin to imagine there being such a thing, you and I are still in our sins. And all who have died in the faith before us, they've all perished. I mean, certainly and understandably, therefore, making the mystifying specter of physical death something that, ooh, yeah, all of us indeed ought to be left terrified of. Fortunately, however, as you read on, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20, thoroughly blows all of that away. Okay. This is where, again, we need to become grounded in the Word of God. This is where our understanding of reality needs to be permanently and forever recalibrated on the basis of the truth of God's Word, okay? Because in verse 20 here, the word of God triumphantly declares, but now 
But now, it doesn't matter when you live, either 100 years ago or 100 years later, whenever, whoever, wherever, whatever, but now Christ is risen from the dead and it says has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. You see, I love the way that the word of God characterizes physical death for those who are in Christ. It says who have fallen asleep. Now that doesn't sound so mystifying, so dark and foreboding, does it? Having fallen asleep doesn't sound so terrifying. In fact, it doesn't even, it doesn't even give a hint of finality. But now Christ has risen from the dead and has become, it says, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Or in other words, those in Christ who have s experienced or had gone through the, the, that point of what we call physical death where there, these physical, temporal, earthly bodies cease to function and die. What happens to them afterwards? So let's begin by getting into that phrase, okay? The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Jesus Christ, who has been raised from the dead, is the first fruits. First fruits refers to that which is the first in a given set or order. In other words, yeah, number one and everybody else and everything else follows thereafter. First one through the door, everyone else gets to follow. So it is, okay? So Jesus Christ being the first in the order of those who are destined to realize what he alone already now has already realized after having fallen asleep. And we know that when he gave up the ghost on the cross that his physical earthly body, the temporal body that he was clothed in, that was just like ours that we're in now today, ceased to function then and it died. He, well, has fallen asleep. It happened to him and uh, we look to him now as the first in the order to realize now, okay, what's gonna happen to us when that time comes, okay? And um, being the first fruits, this is where we, now the, the curtain now begins to open to the glory of the resurrection of the dead. Okay. Anyway, falling asleep. I love it. Like I said, it's beautiful. It's a, it's, I think it so perfectly in, and appropriately characterizes what happens to the soul and the spirit? What will happen to us the moment that our bodies cease to function and die? Falling asleep, it, it does. It, re it refers now to that eternal soul and spirit experience and the state of being that happens immediately at the moment, these physical, earthly, corruptible bodies that we currently inhabit, for whatever reason, cease to function and die. Falling asleep. Now, you know, I have to admit at this point that I found it way too easy, especially considering the nature of the subject that we're into here, to, you know, want to get ahead of ourselves and where we are in our text today. Because it would be great if we just go, okay, now from the point of physical death, let's just, man, I want to bust on through and I want to just go for all of it. You should. And I don't blame any of you for wanting to do that, but you know, we can't really get ahead of ourselves. So I'm gonna let you in on this fact ahead of time, okay? As we get into verses 20 and 21 today, and then a few more, um, prepare yourselves. As we cover what we're gonna cover today, to be left with, and I love this, you, you should, to be left with a compelling sense of, of wonder because it is like you will have stepped into a wonderful whole new reality. It's just, and you're gonna, you're really gonna want to know everything you can about it, okay? So you are, I think, following today's teaching, you will be left with a compelling sense of wonder about things that I assure you will be revealed and clarified as we go on in this chapter. I mean, after all, as I've said before, we're talking 
eternal realities here. So anyway, are you guys ready to get on with it? You ready to step through that door? Okay. Well, now, I love the fact he says now. It means now, but now Christ is risen. And, and now is really great. It's a great place to start from. Not before, not after. Let's deal with now, okay? This is where the door opens. And so now, right now, we know from the gospel's account that just prior to experiencing the death of his physical, temporal, earthly body on the cross where Jesus was crucified, Jesus told the penitent thief who was crucified alongside of him, he told him, quote, unquote, the thief said, ask Jesus, remember me today when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied this to him because he knew he was going to die too. They were, <laughs> there was three of them there, and they were all going to die. They were all going to suffer physical death. And he told the penitent thief, the one who turned and placed his faith in, in him, he said, today you will, not you might be, you could be. He said, today you will be with me in paradise. Paradise. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Jesus was actually talking about the same place he referred to in the parable of the rich man and the beggar in the 16th chapter of Luke. It's what he referred to there as Abraham's bosom. It was a literal place. Now, we're, we're outside the realm of physical reality now, okay? We are now entering into eternal realities. We're dealing with spirit and soul here, okay? So this was a literal place where the souls of all who since the beginning, and they're all there in the Old Testament, and they're part, they're, many of them are cataloged in the, what we call the Faith Hall of Fame in Hebrews chapter 11, but um, where the souls of all who since the beginning had received, believed in, and walked through this life in their appointed place and time, in faithful and focused pursuit of God's purpose and promise that had been revealed to them, as I said, in their appointed place and time. And this is the place where their soul and spirits were resting. Remember the term fallen asleep? Okay. Were resting in perfect peace free of all the issues, the struggles, the effort, and the afflictions that we know are inherent in living in this fallen world in these weak, frail, corruptible earthly bodies that you and I currently inhabit. But they were free of all of that now. And there they were, they'd fallen asleep, they were resting in peace, waiting for the appointed time of their resurrection. This is something that theologians have referred to as the intermediate state of the dead. Well, they aren't really dead when you think about it. Remember, Jesus told Martha, he who believes in me, though he may die, yet he shall live. He who believes in me shall never die. Remember that? Well, when you talk about the soul and the spirit, we see the body from our perspective as having died. We can't see the soul and the spirit. They're immaterial, okay? And so from that point, there's this intermediate state between that point of physical death and the, the resurrection in God's eternally predetermined time. It's that point. It's that period of time. It's that place of rest which is essentially what the soul and the spirit of those who are in Christ, even to this day now, will experience immediately. At the point when these earthly temporal bodies cease to function and die, they will enter into say, a place of rest and peace, just incredible bliss, explaining why verse 20 uses the expression. As I said, it's so appropriate. It says, who've fallen asleep. The thing is, the difference between this fallen asleep and, well, 
what we currently experience while these earthly bodies are still alive and we fall asleep at night, you know, whatever, is, is that following physical death, though the soul and spirit are no longer encumbered with the issues and the problems that these earthly bodies experience, they're free of it now. They are nonetheless fully conscious of where they are in a place that is wonderful beyond description. A place, like I said, that Jesus himself referred to. And again, this is why we go to the word of God, okay? Jesus himself referred to as he called it paradise. Where the soul and spirit simply get to without any further concern or regard for either time, feelings, need, no fear, no suffering, no pain. There's nothing to, to be troubled with. No effort, no frustration, no pain, failure, or affliction, because all of that will have forever been left behind when they got to leave these earthly bodies behind. It's like a it's like a wonderful, incredibly beautiful dream. The only thing is, is that now and forever, it's, it's totally for real. Wow. <clears throat> and I love the fact of this business of, of resting because, see, this is what happens. This is what you can look forward to. When you, who through faith in Jesus Christ, love, look, and live for being with him in his eternal kingdom instead of the lust of this world and the things of this present life that the rest of the world is after, striving after, struggling after, fighting after, worrying about just you know, all of the things. With, you know, First John refers to it as the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. When you live for Christ... And you live for that which is above rather than that which is here, then guess what? The minute your body ceases to function and dies, your spirit and soul, you find yourself there. That is, that's what you've been living for. That's what you've been loving and looking for, right? Well, hey, you just cross the finish line and into that realm, and it's like, oh, I'm home. Well, I really do feel sorry for the people who lived for the things of this world. Because for them, <laughs> when their bodies cease to function and die, their soul and the spirit will continue to, 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 they'll be driven by those lusts that they lived for in this life. All those passions and those desires that they lived for and gave themselves over in this life, the only thing is now they don't have a body with which to experience the pleasures or to satisfy those lusts. It is something that will drive them on forever and ever with no, though there, there will be no satisfaction. They won't have them, but they'll long for it and they'll, it'll just like eat them, their soul and spirit forever and ever like a fire. So anyway, you know, there's kind of a difference there, but I want you to think of it as you who are in Christ Jesus, who are loving, looking, and living for being with Jesus, looking for those things that are above rather than those things that are beneath, and set your eyes and your hearts on those things, and having the Holy Spirit within you even now is testimony to the fact that you've been, you're going to inherit those things in Christ, and they are reserved for you even in the heavens now. When that moment in your body ceases to function and dies, yes, you enter into that. And your faith in Christ is a result of what Christ has accomplished for you through his miraculous incarnation, his sinless life, his selfless suffering, his atoning death and his victorious resurrection. You will find yourself resting in wonderful peace and bliss. No more struggle, no more strife. No more pain, no more affliction, no more sickness. None of the things of this present life and that these earthly temporal bodies were so troubled by. 
So where is this place anyway? Well, you know, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, referring to Jesus when he passed, when his body, earthly body, ceased to function and died there on the cross, it explains to us here, it says, regarding Jesus, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive, and gave gifts to men. Now, this, it goes on to say, it's very clear. He ascended, what does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. So up until the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus, the first time he came, paradise, or Abraham's bosom, we're told had been in the lower or the lowest parts of the earth. Now. You think about this from any place on the earth, because the earth is round, right? Any place, the lowest possible place you can get from any place on the earth, it's going to be the center of it, right? The center of the earth, okay? Now, I know what geologists and scientists um, believe that the center of the earth is like physically, and yeah, indeed, I, they can find those things out. There's plenty of empirical evidence on the basis of, of shooting radar waves and, and uh, the, you know, seismic testing and things like that to determine the densities and the things that exist down there, what it's like. It's probably, you know, physically speaking, it would be impossible. These bodies, nothing could physically exist down there. But face it, not having a physical body meant that the extreme physical conditions that scientists have reason to believe exist at the core of the earth isn't at all an issue to be concerned about because we're talking about, well, minus the physical body, we're talking immaterial soul and spirit. So, okay, I hope we got that aside because many would say, well, it's impossible for anything to exist down there. Uh, yeah, I get that, physically speaking. Anyway, so during the time between Jesus' physical death on the cross and his resurrection, the third day following, Jesus' soul and spirit would have rested among all who in the faith, in the faith, that is faith, trusting, believing, and walking in pursuit of what it is that God had promised and shown them in their appointed place and time, what they had experienced, having had experienced physical death, uh, were now in that place. And they've been there, you know, since time recorded, which we're talking pretty much people of the Old Testament, going clear back to the beginning. Okay, so they were down there, and Jesus was down there with them. Okay, then on the third day, following his crucifixion, Jesus' spirit and soul, we know, came forth into this world for a time. It was a little over 40 days. Clothed in now his eternally incorruptible heavenly physical body. Following which, okay, we know again now some 40 plus days following his crucifixion. In that very same physical, incorruptible, eternal heavenly body he ascended to heaven and people saw him ascending to heaven at which time in the process of which he's going to heaven and guess what we're told that what did he do he led captivity captive meaning he took with him the spirit and souls of all those who'd been resting in the lower parts of the earth with him into heaven in other words, he basically closed out paradise in the center of the earth and took all of it with him to heaven, where they now, along with the rest of us who die in the faith, loving, looking, and living for Jesus here in this present life, will get to rest also in our time in perfect and blissful peace. 
free from all the struggles, the efforts, the afflictions that, that we're currently enduring and will have endured in these earthly physical bodies. And we'll find ourselves resting, resting in peace in the loving presence and the care of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So it's true. If you've chosen to live for Jesus in this present life, the moment your temporal earthly body ceases to function and dies, you, speaking of your eternal soul and spirit, will immediately, well, suddenly find yourself having fallen into a blissful state of rest and peace in a place Jesus referred to as paradise. There in his presence and his care in heaven. It will probably seem at the moment that happens that your body ceases to function, the monitor goes flatline, and you are free of these, if this physical earthly body it will seem to you like you've drifted into a beautiful dream. The thing is, as I said, however, it will be totally blissfully and wonderfully real. Beyond anything you could ever imagine in the here and now, just as 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 declares that, Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. What the Bible reveals to us about this place, what it does show us is wonderful, but it can't even, what is recorded for us here can't even be, doesn't even scratch the surface. You may recall at one point Paul had talked about the fact that he knew a man, and I think he was talking about himself, he said, who had been caught up in a vision by the Spirit of God into the third heaven, in other words, there in the presence of the Lord, and saw and heard things, he said, first of all, that were inexpressible. That means they, the, heaven rea the heavenly realities of what it's like could not even be expressed with human language. It's not even possible. But it, it, even if it were, he said, they are things which would not be lawful to talk about. In other words, uh, they're forbidden even to be revealed. They, these are the th secret things of God, but they will become real to us at that point. Man, doesn't, <laughs> aren't, you, aren't you starting to look forward to this? So, you know, this is precisely what Colossians 3, 2 encourages you and I as we, it's we're passing through this present life. It says to set your mind on things above, not on things of this earth. Because if the things above are what you're living for, man, when you pass in, in the faith, pass away from this present life and these earthly temporal bodies, having lived for those things through faith in Jesus Christ, you will find yourself in that wonderful place of bliss and rest. And yet, I love what Ronald Reagan once said. He said, you ain't seen nothing yet. And this is the point, I think, all the while knowing that the best is yet to come. Because remember, we're talking about an intermediate state of being. Between the point where the physical body ceases to function and dies, and we receive our glorious, eternal, heavenly, physical resurrection bodies. Remember what we were told, that Christ, in his resurrection from the dead, is said has become the first fruits. Meaning that He's the first in the order of those who, having, having fallen asleep in Christ, are destined to likewise inherit an eternally perfect, incorruptible, physical resurrection body. Yeah, it's kind of like I was saying that, you know, it's like he's, he's, he's gone through the door. He's already busted through, and the promise of God, you want to know what God has for you forever? Look at Jesus. Were he raised from the dead? Well, hey, 
He's the first. His resurrection is the assurance that ours is going to follow in God's appointed time. We're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, look at verses 21 and 22 in your Bible now, because it tells us here. It says, for since by man came death, and that was, you know, it all began with Adam. The first man, Adam and Eve, when they blew off God, decided they wanted to do things their own way. It says, well, now, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. We know that Christ came into this world the first time as one of us. It says, for as in Adam all die, because, yeah, we have the same body Adam was, had, a body made of the earth that's temporal, that's frail, that's corruptible, okay? And Jesus Christ took that same body upon himself when he was born of a virgin and walked in this life as one of us. Even so, we're told now, as in Adam, all die physical death. So in Christ, in Christ. Remember, he's the first fruits, right? Get, get your eyes on him, man. You want to follow him. So in Christ, all shall be made alive. See, here's the deal. This is the descendants of the first man of the earth, Adam. Like him, all of us are born into this life in an earthly, frail, corruptible, physical body. A body which eventually succumbs to physical death. Because again, well, like Adam, hey, we've all thought and conducted ourselves with a disregard for God as well as his will for our lives and others. In other words, we we're talking sin, which according to Romans 6, verse 23, earns these earthly temporal bodies of ours a one-way ticket to the grave. <laughs> but fortunately, according to God's gracious and eternally predetermined redemptive plan for the ages, Jesus, who came to this world the first time clothed in a corruptible physical body like ours, unlike us, he lived a sinless life. And he did so on our behalf. Whereby, as a result, following the physical suffering and death that he willingly endured in our behalf on the cross to atone for our sins against God, Jesus was resurrected from the dead in an eternally perfect, incorruptible physical heavenly body serving well is an example a living example to all to all remember said so in Christ shall all be made alive well here's who the all are says is a living example to all who have been chosen in response to that wonderful message of the gospel to turn from themselves and all else to commit their faith, their lives, their hope, and their destiny to Jesus instead. That the resurrection body now we are destined to inherit and forever inhabit is certain to follow, certain to be realized in the time that God has always determined that it will. See, the thing that you and I need to remember, however, is the fact that as 1 Corinthians chapter 15, look at verse 20, forms all of us. It tells us, this resurrection, it says, it will happen, it says that each in his own order. And that's the thing you need to remember about God. God is not the author of confusion. With God, everything, there is an order. It's the way it is, okay? There is an order, not chaos, not confusion. So it says, but each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, and then here we go, check it out. And afterwards, those who are Christ's at his coming. Now you know when our resurrection is going to take place. It says, at his coming. Talking about his certain imminent second coming. Which is, this is something that we should also be loving, looking, and living for. That is, if. It's a big if, okay? That is, if. We're desiring to enter into that blessed rest in Christ the moment these present earthly bodies cease to function and die. So I pray now that if you haven't, 
You know, maybe you've been troubled by the specter of death, bothered by it, and it may, you know, some of you may even terrify you. Now you know what, it means, what it's all about for a believer. It's falling asleep, passing into this wonderful intermediate state of blissful rest and peace in the presence and the care of our Lord and Savior until the time, the appointed time, that we will receive our glorious, eternally incorruptible, heavenly physical bodies at the time of Christ's second coming. I'd say God's got a pretty nice setup waiting for us, don't you think? But right now, as you pass through the trials of this present life, the challenges, the issues, the sorrows, the griefs, as well as the joys and the sense of fulfillment and all the wonderful blessings that God so graciously bestows upon us in the course of this life. Well, just know it now awaits that one day when these bodies cease to exist, they cease to function and they die, well, man, you will be, I'm home. I'm home. Praise God. I'm home.